Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today, we're continuing our study of this uh, book, More Than a Carpenter, by Josh McDowell. Uh, today, we're going to uh, pick up where we left off, starting with uh, Chapter 5. Now, if you have not seen the previous studies, uh, those videos are uh, uploaded and available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. I hope you will go back and watch it all from the beginning. Okay, with me today, I have Brother Joe. You want to say hi to everybody before we get started? Sure, Luke. Uh, this is Joe from the Sebastian Dresden channel, and uh, we're reviewing one of the most important uh, little books in, in the past 50 years. So, very excited about it. And uh, Chapter 5 uh, is very interesting, so I, I hope you'll enjoy it. Okay, thanks. Uh, all right. Chapter 5, titled, Who Would Die for a Lie? One area often overlooked in challenges to Christianity is the transformation of Jesus' apostles. Their changed lives provide solid testimony for the validity of his claims. Since the Christian faith is historical, to investigate it, we must rely heavily upon testimony, both written and oral. There are many definitions of history, but the one I prefer is a knowledge of the past based upon testimony. If someone says, I don't believe that's a good definition, I ask, well, do you believe that Napoleon lived? They almost always reply, yes. Have you seen him? I ask, and they confess they haven't. How do you know then? Well, uh, they are relying on testimony. Uh, this definition of history has one inherent problem. The testimony must be reliable or the hearer will be misinformed. Christianity involves knowledge of the past based upon testimony. So, now we must ask, were the original oral testimonies about Jesus trustworthy? Can they be trusted to have conveyed correctly what Jesus said and did? I believe they can. I'll pause there and get your, your thoughts on that. We established uh, last, uh, last uh, time we were together that eyewitness testimony is is the most powerful testimony uh, at least in in many people's opinion uh when uh, presenting a case of any sort and uh so then you go to the uh the reliability of the uh, eyewitness and uh luckily for us the bible is replete with uh solid characters of high reputation and also a complexity between the eyewitnesses that almost preclude any collusion or, or a mistake of memory. Now, we believe as Christians that, that the scripture is inspired and God breathed, but to the, even to the non-believer, uh, the, the character of the witnesses and the, the uh, circumstances where there should be contradictions are absent. And so uh, really powerful. Uh, uh, testimony. Back to you, Luke. I'm a, just a little bit slow because while you're talking, I thought I'd Google the definition of the word history just so we get that uh, viewpoint. And it says um, the study of past events, particularly in human affairs. Um, n number two would be the whole series of past events connected with someone or something. And number three is continuous, typically chronological record of important or public events or a particular trend or situ or institution. Well, I guess those were rather interesting, but uh, I was just curious if people would challenge uh, Josh McDowell's uh, definition or application of the, the word or idea of history, 
uh, I don't know why they'd object to his definition. Uh, but to me, I, I've always uh, said the word history, I, I have <laughs> kind of defined it a, a, a different way. And that is the, the first three letters is his. And so I would say it's his story. Now, whose story? The story about our great creator, God and savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's the story about him, what he's done and uh, his relationship to, to his creation and us. Um, but I think that uh, Josh McDowell's definition is certainly very suitable. I mean, it's, we, we rely on uh, the testimony of either eyewitnesses or uh, people who've uh, secondhand or thirdhand, you know, the closer we get to the uh, original uh, person or uh, of historic person, uh, if, if you were actually observing them, uh, you were an eyewitness to their lives, uh, and you were able to record them, the events of their lives, then that would be probably the best uh, way, assuming that the, the, the witness uh, is reputable and honest. Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to read on. Any, anything else you want to say before I go forward? Yeah, uh, I'll just interject because I'll forget if I don't. Uh, what, what comes to mind uh, is history is written by historians. And historians, uh, by definition, usually uh, uh, means people who are recording uh, what has already happened. And in most cases, they aren't eyewitnesses, but they're getting it secondhand, thirdhand, uh, fourthhand. Uh, they're getting it from accounts of other writings and piecing it together. Uh, and some historians have a tendency to uh, uh, have color in their spectacles. And, and some history is written with an eraser. Uh, and uh, uh, some history is, is uh, slanted. Uh, you know the old uh, game where you whisper something in someone's ear and it goes around a circle of 20 people and when it uh, comes to the other end. It's nothing like what it started. And uh, biblical history is recorded largely by uh, first-hand e e uh, eyewitnesses. And so uh, our historians are uh, a big asset uh, for credibility. It, let's take Abraham Lincoln. Uh, what's the most accurate history about Abraham Lincoln? Well, it was the speeches that he wrote in his own hand that have been preserved, like the Gettysburg Address. Uh, the Bible is replete with Getty, Gettysburg addresses, first-hand knowledge, first-hand written. And so uh, a mighty powerful thing when he considers 2,000 years old. Yeah, well, I thought you were going to reference the, that saying that uh, history is written by the victors. And so some people challenge the uh, truth uh, the veracity of history uh, because the the victor is going to write it biased uh, based upon you know how how they uh, they either saw it or they want it to be perceived. Yeah, I just heard a I heard a, a couple of commentators on Fox News uh, just last week, and they were saying, you know, I wonder what history is going to say about President Obama, you know, 30, 40, 50, 100 years from now. And uh, uh, Charles Krauthammer uh, wisely said, well, that entirely depends on who writes it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, regarding being written by the victor, uh, I think in, in um, the case of Christianity, the, the historical record, uh, uh, Christianity, most of the time, we wouldn't really consider it to be the victor. Uh, in, in, except that the growth uh, of, of Christianity defies the uh, any logic because in the beginning, uh, the emperors of Rome, first the, first the Jewish people and then the emperors of Rome, uh, their, their, one of their main uh, objectives was to stamp it out completely and for, for centuries. 
uh, actually, I would say even for millennia, even and even today, there are people who want to stamp out Christianity. And yet it... Uh, That's a really interesting point, Luke. Uh, man, I, I, I didn't catch that, but that is really interesting. We It was, you know, Christian histories uh, were not written by the victors. Each one of the disciples uh, uh, and the main authors of the New Testament were executed. I hardly call them the winners. And uh, and something you said uh, yesterday that, that comes back to mind when you said this is that all of the frailties and failures and what would appear to be uh, uh, poor judgments appear in our histories that the losers wrote and have been perfectly preserved. Uh, not losers to us, but in their own time. Uh, being executed is not really the stance of a winner. Yeah, I mean, the, we know that um, Christianity has been victorious if, uh, because everybody who has come to believe on Jesus Christ is their savior God has victory over uh, the judgment and uh, of death and uh, we're promised immortality eternal life in, in the new heavens and new earth so what could be more victorious than that and yet if you look at victory or success in a, in a the way most of the world would define it it would be conquests and, and uh, uh, the True Christianity has never been one that conquers and, and you know has military victories and of course Roman Catholicism, which is not true Christianity, uh, I believe it's the the largest religious uh, or Christian cult in the world. Uh, I have a playlist titled Roman Catholicism Debunked. So if you think that I'm overstating this, then I hope you'll watch that playlist and and get you know all the reasoning behind my claim. Uh, but so if, if we think that uh, Christianity hasn't been victorious in that sense of, uh, you know, conquering and, and ownership, uh, then uh, we didn't write, the, the, you know, the way that the world sees history. And if the victor writes the story, um, that you have that perspective. But fortunately, in the Bible, we have the martyrs and I, I, every one of them. Every one of these authors in this New Testament book here, I can't think of any author of the, any book in the New Testament uh, that wasn't martyred. Uh, John lived in old age, but he was martyred in the sense that he was sentenced in, to prison. They tried to kill him. Uh, legend goes that they boiled him in oil, but uh, he, he couldn't be killed, so they had to cast him off into exile. Uh, so this, the, these books, this historical record was written by the martyrs. Yes, brother, go ahead. Yeah, it, it's it's interesting that one of the very one of the things that prove uh, the Bible to be uh, 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 delivered through people by God is that uh, prophecies. And <laughs> if you stop and think about it, the founder of our faith, the Creator, we believe, uh, one of the very first prophecies he gave was the nation that I came to save will be defeated and 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 cast throughout the whole world. Their temple, won't, a stone won't be left on top of another, and uh, they'll they'll come back together in the, in the last days and and form a nation in a day. But you know the first the first prophecy given by the the founder of our faith uh, said that uh, those that he came to save would be utterly destroyed and the nation would be lost. <laughs> that's that's not the kind of thing that. Uh, victors proclaim in their histories. Yeah, one, one final thought on this word history uh, before we move on is that uh, you, when you were uh, describing history, you, you're talking about it's a record of past events. But the Bible uh, actually has uh, what we, we refer to as prophecy, and that is a record of future events. <laughs> so the Bible actually uh, is a record of past history, and it's also a record of future history. Uh, you know. Yeah, that, that's mighty interesting. I, I mean, God stands outside of time, and, and that's a, a powerful, powerful proof 
uh, just taking into account the one uh, uh, prophecy uh, that was made that I mentioned, there's many, many that are coming true and did come true, such as the destruction of Israel and its temple in exactly the way that Christ said it would happen, it did happen. And so he was writing history before it happened. Now we look back and uh, the words, the, the Bible says, you know, uh, prophecy is given so that when these things happen, you'll know that uh, uh, they happen the way they, that uh, it was said it would, and you'll know that it had to be God that said it. And so it's proved itself uh, through histories in the future that came to pass. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll continue reading on here. It says, uh, I can trust the apostles' testimonies because of those men, 11 died martyrs' deaths on the basis of two things, the resurrection of Christ and their belief in him as the Son of God. They were tortured and flogged, and they finally faced death by some of the cruelest methods then known. And here's a list of them and their, and their, their uh, method of death. And Peter, crucified. Andrew, crucified. Matthew, the sword. John, natural death. And yet he was imprisoned in the Isle of Patmos, um, so he did suffer uh, martyrdom in that respect. Uh, five, uh, James, son of Alphaeus, was crucified. Philip, crucified. Simon, crucified. Thaddeus, killed by arrows. James, the brother of Jesus, stoned. Thomas, spear thrust. Bartholomew, crucified. James, son of Zebedee, the sword. And um, there's a... Uh, there's a book I've recommended many, many times already over the all these years on YouTube uh, that uh, if, if you have the stomach to read it, it's not easy because uh, it's, it's the most graphically violent thing you'll ever read. But it's a historical record of Christian martyrs um, from the beginnings of the church all through history and, and the, the horrible ways that they were tortured and killed. And it's, as I said, it's graphic detail. Uh, the book is called Fox's Book of Martyrs. And um, there's other books that I've seen also on that. Uh, you've got the book called Jesus Freaks, which is a similar type of a book. It's not nearly as graphic, and, but it, and it's also more contemporary. But uh, these, uh, if you can stand to read these things, uh, the reason I think it's important to read them is so we can appreciate what uh, the the early Christian believers, a Christian believer is, uh, uh, the word for it in the Bible is a saint. And so, of course, if you come out, out of Roman Catholicism, then you, you think a saint is just a, an elite, special, highest, uh, most uh, accomplished Christian. Only the very best Christians ever become saints. But the Bible says all Christians are saints. So all these saints that have been martyred throughout history, um, what it what it took for uh, the, us to get the Bible, uh, many people's lives were, were uh, sacrificing horribly because of their, their defending and, uh, and believing in the Bible rather than the teachings of, of the Roman Catholic uh, clergy and the, the popes. Uh, and many were also killed also because they, they rejected the teachings of Romanism, particularly their teachings on uh, salvation and and all, also that uh, the Eucharist, that the, uh, the the bread that you eat in communion was literally the the, the flesh of Jesus. It was it's called transfiguration. That when the priest blesses it, it's literally transformed. I mean, it's, no, it's called transfiguration. Is different. That's the that's when uh, I won't go sidetracked into that, but it's called transubstantiation. In other words, the substance of bread is changed, is transformed into flesh, the flesh of Jesus. And um, the people who would not believe that, uh, you know, they would be killed. Uh, so for these, these are for these reasons, uh, people 
uh, saints, real Christians, they were killed throughout all of history. And, uh, and much of what they suffered was, was to uh, give us this. And, I'm, you know, so if you have a Bible, every time you read it, you should be thanking these, uh, all these saints who suffered martyrdom uh, so, that, so that we could have a Bible. Yeah, I, I actually read Fox's Book of Martyrs uh, when I was about 11 or 12 years old. Uh, it was kept uh, away from the kids in the church library, along with a lot of other books that uh, attracted my attention because they, they, if they would have left it on the bottom shelf, I would have ignored it completely. But uh, I was uh, impacted greatly to this day uh, reading that, that account. All right. Um, these uh, 12 ex names and uh, examples of, of martyrs that I just read, this is just a tiny sampling. Uh, if the list was complete, uh, we probably have a list of, of, of actually more than a million. Uh, the response that is usually chorused back is this. Why uh, a lot of people, oh, I'm sorry, it's written this way why a lot of people have died for a lie, so what does it prove? Uh, yes, a lot of people have died for a lie, but, uh, but, they, but they thought it was the truth. Now, if the resurrection didn't take place, if it was false, the disciples knew it. I find no way to demonstrate that they could have been deceived. Therefore, these 11 men not only died for a lie, here's the catch, but they knew it was a lie. It would be hard to find 11 people in history who died for a lie knowing it was a lie. What's your thoughts on that? Well, that that's really compelling. I mean, honestly compelling you know it, it, as soon as you start mentioning uh those listed in the fox's book of martyrs you, you immediately uh start thinking well muslims die for their faith all the time they can't wait to get to uh their paradise or whatever uh but but these are men who would have had to have died for a complete lie and uh, uh the muslims are deceived and so many other religions uh, are blindly following whatever faith, they believe it. Well, unlike anything else, the disciples would have had to have been actively spreading a deception and then separately, not even in a group, separately dying for an intentional deception. Uh, it makes no sense. It doesn't pass the smell test. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, particularly uh, at this time in history, uh, the first th the first group that comes to our mind when we think of people willing being willing to die for their their faith uh, are the the Muslims who are, seem to be so anxious to die, they desire to die, they love death, uh, but they're willing to die because they believe their faith is true. Uh, they believe that uh, they're going to get a reward as a martyr in paradise. Uh, but the reason uh, this doesn't work with the, the, the apostles, especially, is that they were all eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, he, he was, he, we were talking about prophecy earlier. To me, the, the most important and greatest prophecy in all of history is when Jesus prophesied his bodily resurrection. He did it on numerous occasions uh, in his ministry. And the Jews, uh, they, they were known for demanding a sign, a miraculous sign to prove. Uh, so Jesus had claimed that he's God and he's Savior, he's the Messiah. And uh, they didn't believe it and said, prove it to us, give it a sign. And of course, Jesus did tons of miracles. Uh, he fed thousands with uh, the loaves and fishes, and 
He healed the lepers and the lame and the blind and the deaf, and even raised Lazarus from the dead. And, and uh, all these miraculous things that he did, uh, they still, uh, they demanded a sign. And he, he, he did say, uh, the sign that I will give you, the ultimate sign, the, the proof that my claims are true, that I am the Son of God, the Savior, the promised one from the Old Testament, uh, is uh, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And they, they, they said to him, well, it, it, this temple took our fathers 40 years to build. How could you possibly rebuild it in three days? And he said, of course, he, he was referring to the temple of his body. And at a, at a later time, uh, he, he, he made the same prophecy. They were demanding a sign. He said, the only sign I'll give you is the sign of Jonah, just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days uh, and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. So, um, uh, and then it goes on to say that he was, this was a reference to his death, burial, and resurrection. So he prophesied that he would be killed, be crucified, be buried, but raise himself back to life and that resurrection was the sign that uh, he said, this is the, the proof that I am who I claim to be. Uh, so when he did raise himself from the dead and he walked among 500 witnesses for 40 days, um, the, all the apostles, um, many, many disciples, uh, they said uh, about 500 people all together they saw him, they talked to him, they touched him, they ate with him. It was true bodily resurrection. And the, uh, that resurrection is so important and it gives all of us confidence that our faith in Jesus is justified because he proved it. Um, yeah, Luke, in order to have a, a conspiracy, you need conspirators <laughs> and, and uh, the, the, the claim was so fantastical that uh, he had no co-conspirators. Nobody actually could fathom that Christ could raise himself from the dead. So even the people who recognized uh, Christ was, was who he said he was, they, they couldn't wrap their minds around that he would do this thing that he said he would do. And... Uh, it was prophesied 1,600 years before. But again, such a fantastical claim was beyond their ability to grasp, I suppose. And uh, so uh, the conspiracy had no co-conspirators. And uh, it, it took Christ actually rising in the witness of so many and confirmed in so many ways by so many people that uh, it, it, did, it, it didn't... Uh, it, it, it could not have been a conspiracy. It was, it was just the, what happened and recorded as such. Yeah, they, 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 were, they were so certain that there was a bodily resurrection. Uh, they, they were all willing to go to their deaths and suffer and die uh, because they would not denounce and deny this resurrection. Uh, but the point that Josh McDowell is making here is that um, if, if there was no resurrection and they, they were just making up a story about it, then, then they, what they were doing was they were promoting a lie. And Josh McDowell is arguing how many people are going to suffer torture and death uh, knowing that all the while they're, it's, they're just uh, t spreading a lie. If it was a lie, they would they would not uh, be willing to die for it. Uh, but they because they knew it was true, they were all with with no exceptions, all willing to suffer and, and die because they experienced it. They touched him. All right, let me continue on here reading this. Um, 
we need to be cognizant of several factors in order to appreciate what they did. First, uh, when the apostles wrote or spoke, they did so as eyewitnesses of the events they described. Peter said, quote, for we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. That's 2 Peter 1, verse, 12, uh, 6, uh, verse 16. The apostles certainly knew the difference between myth or legend and reality. John emphasized the eyewitness aspect of the Jews' knowledge Quote, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we beheld and our hands handled concerning the word of life, that's Jesus, and the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also that you also may have a fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. I'll stop there for your thoughts. Well, it, it doesn't escape me that these guys uh, also, uh, uh, I think exclusively, died alone. I mean, they, it wasn't like uh, they had uh, a peer group. Uh, uh, of support amongst the the apostles, they were spread all through the through the known world at that time. And uh, uh, when Peter was was crucified uh, in the manner of Christ, he said, "I'm not worthy to be uh, uh, executed as Christ was." And they and he demanded that he be crucified upside down as a sign to to the unbelievers as to his. Uh, honor of Christ. Uh, these guys were standing alone uh, against the masses uh, and, and nobody recanted. Um, it, it, it is clear to me that in their writings uh, they are systematically and purposely uh, laying out a case as a lawyer would. And presenting their arguments in the courtroom, uh, the way this is written, these last few couple of statements here, uh, saying that these are not fables; these are eye, eyewitness accounts, and and emphasizing that. Um, Luke said, "Quote: Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as those." who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. As I said last time, the word is the name for Jesus. Um, servants of the word have handed them down to us. It seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning to write it out for you in consecutive order. That's Luke 1 verses 1 through 3. Brother? Uh well, no thoughts except, you know, it, uh, it's kind of like God laid the case for them. I mean, they, they're, they're simply recording the events, and, and it just comes together as if it were a well-planned court case. But, it, of course, it would have been impossible to do that the way the, the apostles were spread out and over time and, and uh, distance. Okay. Uh, then, in the book of Acts, Luke described the 40-day period after the resurrection when his followers closely observed him, quote, The first account I composed about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen, to these he also <clears throat> presented himself alive, after his suffering, by many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. <clears throat> That's Acts 1, verses 1 through 3. Um, it's interesting. 
Uh, Luke wrote Luke, and he wrote Acts. And in both of these cases, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, in both Acts and Luke, it's the same kind of preamble, the same point he makes at the beginning of each of these books, that uh, this is uh, eyewitness accounts. It's, it's, he's laying down the groundwork that uh, this, is, uh, this is history, and it's proven you know, through eyewitnesses. Is that, is that interesting? Those verses are the same in each book. Well, not, not exactly the same, but he's a, he's accomplishing the same purpose in, in, in Luke and Acts. Yeah, it, it's it is very interesting. I, if if you or I, Luke, were uh, in the towers uh, at 9/11 in the, in the World Trade Center, and uh, and someone was talking about the World Trade Center's destruction. Uh, we might start each and every conversation with, I was there, and I see no difference. It, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that's true. If, if you were an eyewitness of something uh, and you're talking about it, uh, you certainly want to say, before, before you give them the details, say, look, I was there. This is what I saw. Um, John began the last portion of his gospel by saying that there were, quote, many other signs, therefore, Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, unquote. That's John 20, verse 30. I'd like to go back to Acts, though, that last point again. I just thought of something because um, Josh Modell is uh, giving us these verses uh, probably in the NASV or NIV. It's, it, I don't recognize it as the KJV because one thing that always stood out to me in the KJV, it says that, um, uh, it says, to these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs. But in the in the KJV, I know that the, word, the term is by many infallible proofs and I, I think that word infallible is even of course much better than convincing infallible means it's it's, it's absolute convincing means well we can convince you but it, not necessarily true but it's convincing you, uh, you see the, uh, the why i like that word infallible so much well yeah it it, it, it illustrates that uh christ uh didn't just show up saying he was Christ <laughs> as a lookalike or, or something. Uh, this is someone who continued to, he continued to work the miracles he worked while he was uh, in it during his ministry. And, uh, and he knew them and, and they knew him. And uh, to doubting Thomas, who just couldn't wrap his mind around it, this can't be Christ. He's, he got the hole in his side and in his hands. Uh, yeah, I'd say pretty infallible. Okay, this uh, this next uh, portion here, um, it lists a lot of verse addresses. Uh, there's eight, there's 16. Um, 16 verses are listed here. Uh, I guess I can read them off quickly, but uh, it says that the main content of these eyewitness testimonies concerned the resurrection. The apostles were eyewitnesses of his resurrection. And then he has the list, 16 different verses in the book. Um, Luke 24, 48, John 15, 27, Acts 1, 8, Acts 2, 24, and 32. Acts 3.15, Acts 4.33, Acts 5.32, Acts 10.39, Acts 10.41, Acts 13.31, 1 Corinthians 15.4-9, 1 Corinthians 15.15, 15, 1 John 1.2, 1, Acts 22.15, Acts 23.11, Acts 26.16. So we have 16 different locations in the scripture where an eyewitness is giving an account. Uh, okay, second, the apostles 
themselves had to be convinced that Jesus was raised from the dead. At first, they hadn't believed. They, they went and hid. Uh, you'll see this in Mark 14, verse 50. They didn't hesitate to express their doubts. Only after ample and convincing evidence did they believe. There was Thomas, who said he wouldn't believe that Christ was raised from the dead until he had put his finger in their nail prints. Thomas later died a martyr's death for Christ. Was he deceived? He bet his life he wasn't. Um, let me sp stop there because that's an important uh, character and, and, and uh, uh, happening. Brother, what's your thoughts? Yeah, uh, Thomas was uh, the ultimate natural man. I mean, he, he, uh, he would have been an atheist uh, type thinker of today. And uh, when presented with incontrovertible evidence, he had no choice. And, and when he was convinced, uh, he could not deny the truth. And let's not forget the people who uh, were not even followers of Christ, who persecuted him, like Paul. Uh, not only uh, didn't he believe Christ was who he said he was or did what he said he would do, uh, he was hostile towards Christ. And, and uh, his... his uh, uh, conversion on the road to Damascus uh, is uh, an amazing thing. And plus, Christ uh, appeared to John, uh, telling John of future events uh, when he was isolated on the Isle of Patmos. So uh, the resurrection, uh, to me, is pretty well documented. Yeah, well, you, you reference Paul, who was... Uh he was not a, uh, one of the original uh, apostles or even disciples. Uh, he probably was aware at the time of, of Jesus because he lived during that time. He was alive uh, and he was uh, one of the most religious of the, the, the Jewish leaders. Uh, and, but he did late, at a later time, I'm sure this will go into Paul in this book here, but he, he does later on, uh, take upon the, the mantle of persecutor of the church. And, and he, his job is to round up the Christians and imprison them and kill them. And they, uh, and yet when Jesus appeared to him, then of course he was persuaded because Jesus appeared to him. There was a bodily Jesus right there talking to him. And, and, uh, and his, uh, he was changed from a persecutor to one of the, the great uh, apostles. And, um, and, but then you also have other people, even like his brothers, James and Jude. And the Bible says his family didn't, didn't really believe in him. I'm sure Mary did, but the, um, there's no indication that his brothers believed in him until after the resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says that uh, Jesus appeared to his, his brother, James. Uh, so this resurrection, when he appeared to all these people, this was the turning point for many of them. Even the people who were his closest apostles, apart from John, they all doubted and hid up for their lives. And, and then the resurrection was what converted them, saying, changed them from, okay, he's proven himself with this resurrection. And uh, now we're, we're so confident that we're willing to even die if need be, uh, because he's proven himself to us with the resurrection. Um, yeah, and keep in mind, Luke, keep in mind that that uh, John and even his mother, uh, they weren't standing at, at his grave three days later when they knew he said he would raise himself. Uh, uh, they, they went there to, uh, uh, to homage to the body, but uh, we didn't have a vigil of John sitting outside the, the stone waiting for it to roll away. So even as close as the most devout uh, follower, uh, I guess it was too fantastic for him to believe until it happened. And so <laughs> that's more incontrovertible evidence that uh, this was an amazing thing that happened. Uh, there was a movie uh, that was a really high quality uh, Hollywood production that came out this year. The title was Risen, and I, I saw that movie, 
and I, I've been dying to discuss it and do a hangout or uh, on the, but I don't know anybody else who's seen it. So I'm waiting for Bill or you or somebody to get the DVD or something and watch it, and then we can have a discussion. But it was, it's if anybody has an opportunity to see the movie Risen that just came out this last year, you should see it because it, it is a really honest, perfect portrayal of uh, what we get from the Bible and, and even more extra biblical things that uh, have been written about this, uh, about uh, his death, burial, resurrection, and the Jews attempt to uh, uh, stifle this and, and uh, not let anybody believe in the resurrection, try to make people think that there was no resurrection, but the body was actually stolen, was their, their claim. Um, so if you haven't seen that movie, Risen, you, sh you should see that. Uh, brother, did you, did you see it? No, but I've heard really good things and, and the most good things just now. So I, I'll, I'll be looking into it this weekend. Okay, good. Um, but the point that uh, Josh is making in this chapter is that um, if you really believe something uh, in, intensely and, and and thought that everything depended on it, uh, yeah, even a Muslim, they'll, they'll be willing to die uh, because they really, really believe in it. Uh, but if the resurrection did not really happen and the apostles had stolen the body uh, and, and uh, hidden it and, and, and pretended that there was a resurrection, uh, they, they, they all died martyrs' deaths, all, none of them uh, recanting. All they had to do was recant, and they would be spared. They all went to their deaths, uh, unwilling to recant, proclaiming he is risen. Um, and, because, and why would they do it? If it was a lie, at least one or some of them would have, not, would have uh, uh, succumbed to the, the, the torture and, and the, uh, wanted to have their life spared. But none of there's, a huge, there's a huge difference. There's a huge difference between being deceived and being a deceiver. Uh, and uh, uh, deceivers don't don't sacrifice themselves for their lives. The deceived will. And so uh, the the apostles would have had to have all been conspiratorial deceivers. Yeah, that's a very good, uh, very important distinction. That's really what it boils down to. Okay, uh, continue reading. It says, then there was Peter. He denied Christ several times during his trial. Finally, he deserted Jesus. But something happened to, his, to this coward. Just a short time after Christ's crucifixion and burial, Peter showed up in Jerusalem preaching boldly at the threat of death that Jesus was the Christ and had been resurrected. Finally, uh, Peter was crucified upside down. Was he deceived? What had happened to him? What had transformed him so dramatically into a bold lion for Jesus? Why was he willing to die for him? The only explanation I am satisfied with is 1 Corinthians 15, 5, quote, and then he appeared to Cephas, Peter. That's John, uh, that's I guess also John 142. He has two references there. Um, the classic example of a man convinced against his will was James, the brother of Jesus, in Matthew 13, 55 and Mark 6, 3. Although James wasn't one of the original 12, uh, see Matthew 10, verses 2 through 4, he was later recognized as an apostle. And that's in Galatians 1, 19. As were Paul and Barnabas, see Acts 14, 14. When Jesus was alive, James didn't believe his brother Jesus as the Son of God. That's, that's in John 7, verse 5. He, as well as his brothers and sisters, may even have mocked him. Quote, you want people to believe in you. Why don't you go up to Jerusalem and do your thing? For James 
uh, it, it must have been humiliating for Jesus to go around and bring ridicule to the family name by his wild claims. I am the way and the truth and the life. If no one comes to the Father but through me, in John 14, 6. I am the vine, you are the branches, that's John 15, 5. I am the good shepherd, and my own know me, John 10, 14. What would you think if your brother said such things? But something happened to James. Brother? Yeah, I, I mean... Uh... I can't imagine. I've got a lot of sympathy for the for the family of, of Christ. You know, uh, that that would be a hard thing to swallow. You know, Christ said a prophet is not accepted in his hometown. And, uh, uh, you know, I if my brother made some uh, claim that I consider to be wild and embarrassing, uh, I would run from it, not embrace it. And I, I'm sure that's the case with uh, with with his familial uh, gathering there. Okay, something happened to James. After Jesus was crucified and buried, James was preaching in Jerusalem. His message was that Jesus died for sins and was resurrected and is alive. Eventually, James became one of the leaders of the Jerusalem church and wrote a book, the Epistle of James. He began it by writing, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Quote, unquote. Uh, his, his brother, eventually James died a martyr's death by stoning at the hands of Ananias, the high priest, according to Josephus. Was James deceived? No. The only plausible explanation is 1 Corinthians 15, 7. Quote, then he appeared to James. Yeah, the um, yeah, James didn't have they, James did not have the uh, the uh, luxury that the other uh, apostles did. Uh, like like uh, you stated earlier, he was a Johnny come lately. He only believed after it was impossible not to, and so he he did not have the, the advantage of of teachings and uh, the seeing of many miracles and and all of the other signs that that all the apostles did except for Paul and uh, so uh, uh, when he saw the light or had his uh, come to Jesus moment uh, he uh, he was the least schooled and, and the least he just saw what he saw and knew what he knew and stood for it uh, uh, with his life to the end of his life. Yeah, each one of these individual accounts is, is really powerful to me. Uh, uh, Peter and the others were cowards, hiding for their lives, uh, denying they even knew Jesus. Uh, and then after the bodily resurrection, they're preaching, uh, he's risen and, and willing to die for that and, and eventually all dying for it. Uh, Paul was persecuting the church um, and killing them, uh, and Jesus appeared to him, and then Paul became one of the greatest apostles and, and suffered a martyr's death because of his claims about Jesus uh, being our Savior God, and he is risen. Uh, uh, Thomas, he said, I'm not going to believe it unless I touch him, and Jesus appeared to him, he touched him, and Thomas believed, and he proclaimed it, and he, he died a martyr's death proclaiming he's risen. Uh, who was the other one uh, we're talking about? James. <laughs> James, his own brother, uh, mocked him, didn't believe he, his, he was embarrassed by his, his claims. Uh, and then after Jesus died, was buried, and was risen and appeared to James, James became one of the leaders of the church, and in fact, the leader of the church in Jerusalem, and, and then eventually because of his, his claims about Jesus and his faith in him, uh, he suffered a martyr's death too. The resurrection, that eyewitness uh, testimony of his, he is risen was uh, powerfully transformed them all, didn't it? Yeah, I, James is a, is a fascinating character study. 
uh, he, uh, again, like I had mentioned previously, didn't have the advantage that uh, most of the apostles had. And he kind of embraced uh, the, the uh, Judeo uh, worldview that he knew uh, and, and uh, proclaimed the truth of, the, of Christ within that and be, became a, a little bit more of a uh, works focused person because he he uh, he all he knew was the Jewish tradition and he knew his brother was God Almighty the Creator of the universe and uh, and so uh, he had he had a, a, a critical he also was the center of Christians within the center of Juda, Judaism in Jerusalem. So, uh, uh, wow, that's, there's a, there's a story. If, if someone ever wanted to tell it, I, that would make a fascinating movie. Well, uh, I have spent a lot of time discussing James and his uh, position in Jerusalem and the, the, the viewpoint, uh, on, uh, what they thought Christianity to be at the very beginning. Uh, it was only Jews, no Gentiles and they continued practicing Judaism along with believing in Jesus. And eventually it was all corrected and they realized that uh, Christianity was for Gentiles, for the whole world, not just Jews. Yeah, even, even Peter had a hard time accepting that pill. Yeah, and then and they also had to realize that Judaism, they're practicing Judaism, the sacrifices, all the legalism had to be discarded. They have to choose. You're going to follow the law or you're going to just have faith in Jesus. And uh, I have a playlist, um, uh, sh Shocking Facts About um, Paul and James. And that's a, a pretty extensive teaching on um, the, the disagreement at the beginning of the church. I hope everybody will wa watch that. Well, I will go watch that. I didn't know that was, well, your library is big enough, right? It's easy to miss lots of things, but that sounds like a, a really interesting uh, dichotomy to study. Mm -hmm. All right, then. Uh, it says, uh, if the resurrection was a lie, the apostles knew it. Were they perpetuating a colossal hoax? That possibility is inconsistent with what we know about the moral quality of their lives. They personally condemned lying and stressed honesty. They encouraged people to know the truth. The historian Edward Gibbon, in his famous work, The History of, of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, gives the, the quote, pure but austere morality of the first Christians, unquote, as one of five reasons for the rapid success of Christianity. Michael Green, principal of St. John's College, Nottingham, observes that the resurrection, quote, was the belief that the turned, uh, I'm sorry, let me read that again. It was the belief that turned heartbroken followers of a crucified rabbi into the courageous, witnesses and martyrs of the early church. This was the one belief that separated the followers of Jesus from the Jews and turned them into the community of the resurrection. You could imprison them, flog them, kill them, but you could not make them deny their conviction that on the third day he rose again. Oh, just, this is so exciting. I just... Yeah, I mean, I, what, what, when was... Uh... When was Constantine's era? Was that uh, 300 uh, or two, late 200s, early 300s? We forget that. In 312, in 312 he, uh, he had his um, uh, thing on the, with his war in, in the sign I will conquer and became. Yeah, yeah. Okay. A you you got to remember, we, we talk about the disciples and, and how they were crucified and how they, to, the end, to their detriment of their own life would not reject the truth. Uh, we forget the tens of thousands uh, of martyrs that were slaughtered in the most inhumane, bizarre, and uh, terrifying ways uh, by the Roman government uh, during that period. 
between Constantine and, and, and the death of Christ, uh, it was horrifying, terrifying. People would go down the streets. You know, the, the, the symbol of the fish, uh, it used to be that uh, a Christian would see someone he thought may be a follower of Christ, and he would make a half moon in the dirt with a stick. And if the other person uh, made another half moon forming the sign of the fish, they would know they were brothers and, and they were they were free to, to fellowship. But the, the terror of having your family uh, slaughtered in, in horrible rituals and, and games for the entertainment of the masses, uh, all of those people uh, are equally uh, regarded as, as giving their lives as a testimony to their faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, all right, uh, I'll keep reading. Uh, it says, third, the bold conduct of the apostles immediately after they were convinced of the resurrection makes it unlikely that it was all a fraud. They became bold almost overnight. Peter, who had denied Christ, stood up even at the threat of death and proclaimed Jesus alive after the resurrection. The authorities arrested the followers of Christ and beat them, yet they soon would be back in the street speaking out about Jesus. That's in Acts 5, verses 40 through 42. Their friends noticed their buoyancy and their enemies noticed their courage, nor did they preach in an obscure town, but in Jerusalem. Uh, Jesus' followers couldn't have faced torture and death unless they were convinced of his resurrection. The unanimity of their message and course of conduct was amazing. The chances against any large group of being in agreement and is enormous, yet they all agreed on the truth of the resurrection. If they were deceivers, it's hard to explain why one of them didn't break down under pressure. <laughs> yeah, Paul was beaten over and over. Yeah, you know, people have to differentiate. These weren't guys who were willing to, these are guys who were willing to die, but they lived a life of, uh, of waiting for the next uh, persecution. You know, every day they woke up. They had the potential of, uh, of being murdered, beaten, uh, you know, tormented. Uh, this isn't just an instance where they, at the end of their life, they wouldn't or can't. This is a whole lifelong uh, uh, sacrifice for what they knew the truth was. Uh, yeah, I, I do think, isn't it amazing, though, that of, of all of them uh, who were the eyewitnesses, uh, uh, if it was a, a fraud, uh, you know, it seemed like it, at least one or more of them would have broken under the pressure if it was a fraud. Only if the resurrection was true and they had eyewitnessed it could they all have possibly known, I cannot deny it. He came to me, I saw him, I touched him. I cannot deny that because they know that they're going to be resurrected, that even the torture and the death is temporary, but they're promised eternal life and a resurrection of their own. Yeah, and the, and don't forget there was 500 uh, witnesses in addition to, to the apostles who had uh, to live under the pallor of uh, uh, waiting for the, for the uh, people to attack them, murder them. You know, Paul, Saul of Tarsus, was converted. But there was a whole lot of Saul of Tarsus's Pharisees out there looking for Christians to put them to death. And uh, and so they they had to live with that, and, and still their testimony stand. Yeah, okay. Uh Pascal, the French philosopher, writes, quote, The allegation that the apostles were impostors is quite absurd. Let us follow the charge to its logical conclusion. Let us picture those 12 men meeting after the death of Jesus Christ and entering into conspiracy 
to say that he has risen. That would have constituted an attack upon both the civil and the religious authorities. The heart of the man is strangely given to fickleness and change. It is swayed by promises, tempted by material things. If any one of those men had yielded to temptation so alluring or given way to the more compelling arguments of prison and torture, they would have all been lost." Unquote. How have they turned, this is another quote, quote, how have they turned almost overnight, unquote, asks Michael Green, into the indomitable band of enthusiasts who braved opposition, cynicism, ridicule, hardship, prison, and death in three continents as they preached everywhere Jesus and the resurrection, unquote. I'm so thankful for that resurrection. Yeah, you know, uh, Blaise Pascal, uh, one of the one of the smartest men ever to walk the face of the earth. Uh, I just wrote down a whole bunch of quotes uh, from a, a video that uh, Truth Speller channel put up, and uh, you know, he was quick to say, "Listen, I know this doesn't make sense. You know, uh, you mustn't." It's he said, "You must not reproach me for the reason of this doctrine." since I admit it to be without reason so fantastic, uh, but the foolishness is wiser than all of the wisdom of, wisdom of men. Blaise Pascal uh, took a lot of heat, uh, even during his era uh, when, when Christianity was more widespread, uh, but uh, when Pascal's wager still lives on today, uh, I'm willing to bet on Christ this the logic uh, forces me to yep um, an unknown writer descriptively narrates the changes that occurred in the lives of the apostles quote on the day of the crucifixion they were filled with sadness on the first day of the week with gladness at the crucifixion, they were hopeless. On the first day of the week, their hearts glowed with certainty and hope. When the message of the resurrection first came, they were incredulous and hard to be convinced. But once they became assured, they never doubted again. What could account for the astonishing change in these men in so short a time? The mere removal of the body from the grave could never have transformed their spirits and characters. Three days are not enough for a legend to spring up which would so affect them. Time is needed for a process of legendary growth. It is a psychological fact that demands a full explanation. Think of the character of the witnesses, men and women who gave the world the highest ethical teaching it has ever known, and who even on the testimony of their enemies lived it out in their lives. Think of the psychological absurdity of picturing a little band of defeated cowards cowering in an upper room one day and a few days later transformed into a company that no persecution could silence and then a attempting to attribute this dramatic change to nothing more convincing than a miserable fabrication they were trying to foist upon the world. That simply wouldn't make sense, unquote. Yeah, and that's, that's a good point. He makes a really good point there. Legends and, uh, and uh, fables take forever to take hold. I mean, it's not something you start on uh, uh, Monday and and, uh, and it's going all around the world on Friday. Uh, the Dionysian tradition, you know, that was a, uh, people uh, took hundreds of years uh, developing that and, and nobody died for it. And they were, you know, they were always adding gods and and, uh, and uh, taking pleasure in, in their uh, belief system. Uh, this is rather unique it, overnight. Uh, Christ proved himself to the world uh, unlike any fable or legend and people uh, 
took no earthly pleasure uh, or gain, but rather just the opposite, or willing to endure hell on earth to not to to embrace him and not deny the truth. Boy, it's, it's such a joy to read this book again. Kenneth Scott LaTourette writes, quote, the effects of the resurrection and the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the disciples were of major importance. From discouraged, disillusioned men and women who sadly looked back upon the days when they had hoped that Jesus was he who should redeem Israel, they were made over into a company of enthusiastic witnesses. Unquote. Paul Little asked, quote, are these men who helped transform the moral structure of society, consummate liars or deluded madmen? These alternatives are harder to believe than the fact of the resurrection, and there is no shred of evidence to support them, unquote. Yeah, like we stated earlier, they, these guys knew what Christ said. They, they, they believed he, he was who he said he was. But nobody was waiting at that garden tomb three days later. Nobody. I mean, um, uh, Mary uh, and Martha, I forget, I went to uh, add uh, uh, scents to the body or, or, or just clean the grave site. I don't know. But they weren't there to witness the resurrection. I know that. And, uh, and as far as all of his disciples, they were out, well, you know, geez, I don't, I don't understand this. Uh, you know, how, can, how could they have killed the, the Creator? How could they have killed our Lord? And, and they, they just, they could not grasp the, 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 the fantastic uh, thing that was about to happen. And their mind wouldn't wrap around it. Nobody, nobody believed to the point of being there when that stone rolled away. Amen. Uh, the steadfastness of the apostles, even to death, cannot be explained away. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, Origen records that Peter was crucified head downward. Herbert Workman describes Peter's death, quote, Thus Peter, as our Lord had prophesied, was girt by another and carried out to die along the Aurelian Way to a place hard by the gardens of Nero on the Vatican Hill, where so many of his brethren had already suffered a cruel death. At his own request, he was crucified head downwards as unworthy to suffer like his master." Unquote. Harold Mattingly, in his history text, writes, quote, the apostles, St. Peter and St. Paul, sealed their witnesses with their blood, unquote. Tertullian wrote that, quote, no man would be willing to die unless he knew he had the truth, unquote. Harvard law professor Simon Greenleaf, a man who lectured for years on how to break down a witness and determine whether or not a witness is lying, concludes, quote, the annals of military warfare afford scarcely an example of the like heroic con constancy, patience, and unflinching courage. They had every possible motive to review carefully the grounds of their faith and the evidences of, their, of the great facts and truths which they asserted." Unquote. The apostles went through the test of death to substantiate the veracity of what they were proclaiming. I believe I can trust their testimony more than that of most people I meet today, people who aren't willing to walk across the street for what they believe, let alone die for it. That concludes chapter five. Yeah, I just want to note, uh, I just thought of something. We were talking about the different types of you brought up Simon Greenleaf. Uh, we were talking about the different types of evidence and how important eyewitness testimony is. You know what trumps all of that? Deathbed testimony. It, it just uh, occurred to me. Uh, 
deathbed testimony is assumed, even in today's modern courts, to be uh, substantial and and, uh, and and credible beyond reasonable doubt. Uh, and each and every one of those guys had a deathbed testimony. So that's powerful in a court of law. And additionally, it wasn't just a, a deathbed testimony. You know, I was in here <clears throat> in this very office <clears throat> just last week, Luke, and uh, I saw a spider run across the floor. Man, I was, oh no, you know, it's, it's uh, one of my phobias, and uh, of which there's, there's many. But uh, I was so freaked out, I was terrorized. I, I had to go buy these little stick and spider traps. Uh, I was tearing this office apart, turning chairs over, looking under tables, spotlights. It terrified me to be in here knowing that until I caught that spider, he could run across the floor and bite me or crawl on me, and I wouldn't even see it coming. Uh, and so the terror kept me out of this room pretty much for two days until I caught him on one of those spider traps. Can you imagine going through life knowing what's coming? These guys knew what was coming. Uh, there was no escaping it. They knew their, that their testimony was going to eventuate in a severe and horrifying death, each and every one of them, every day. Uh, and so that's, that's a deathbed testimony on steroids. Oh, well said. I, I never equated that to the deathbed testimony, but it's, it's, it actually is. And, and not only that, as you said, many of them, uh, over the period of years, the knowledge that eventually they're going to be captured and, and tortured and killed in the most cruel way. And uh, never did they, did they uh, uh, back down or change course or, or recant. Um, now, if you ever have any more fears of spiders, brother, here's, here's a little tiny poem that might help you with your fears of spider, okay? Spider, spider on the wall, you know you should not be there at all. You know that wall has just been plastered. Get off that wall, you dirty spider. <laughs> Maybe I'll loop that and play it back at night while I'm not in here just to keep them out of here. But yeah, oh my gosh, am I scared of spiders. But uh, it, it hardly compares to what, what they knew was coming. So... Uh, very cute. Never heard that one before. <laughs> I think I was telling you about my feeble attempts at humor. <laughs> There's an example of it. That was that was hardly feeble. That was wonderful. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> okay, I think uh, we'll we'll end uh, because we finished chapter five. We'll begin with chapter six next time. And uh, let me get to any closing or summary thoughts uh, on the study today from you. Well, I, I, I was surprised the whole way through. I, I must have misremembered or misread. I thought this was the chapter where we were going to address uh, Hitchens and Dawkins and, and their crew. So I had all these notes uh, that I made. Well, when I make a lot of notes, it usually is like four or five. <laughs> because I don't do well with notes. But uh, yeah, today was a surprise to me. I didn't expect the study to, to go in this direction, but uh, lots of lots of uh, interesting and, and uh, enlightening stuff in this chapter. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I, I love this chapter. I mean, the whole book is wonderful, but I, I don't know. I, I, as we continue on, maybe I'll, there's another chapter that I might, uh, say is the, is the best part i because i don't i don't really know what's coming i haven't reread the book recently uh, but but this chapter here the whole subject of the resurrection and the the changed lives of the apostles because of that resurrection that's always been the most powerful testimony to me of all and that that resurrection and, and you know I, there, there, there have been some people uh, over the years that have um, somehow they, they got the idea that you know I, I didn't uh, 
talk about or emphasize or value the resurrection and uh, it's 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 a big misunderstanding because i mean i always include the death burial and resurrection anytime i uh, give a, a gospel message and, and that that resurrection as we we studied it today it just uh, it, it, almost a couple of times i was brought to tears just in joy of thinking about the power of this testimony of the resurrection that resurrection as paul says uh if there was no resurrection our faith is all in vain well that's that's one of the reasons i, I like our little fellowship here uh because you know this is something that requires thought and and i did a quick speed read uh in preparation for uh, our little series we're doing here and you know i i, I uh, took speed reading for dummies 101 got my little piece of paper looking for keywords as I scan down each line and, you know, try to do uh, uh, 10 pages a minute or so. And, and you don't stop and think that way. And, and like so many things in life, uh, you just, it's like a dog, uh, you throw him the best steak uh, that you have and he, he doesn't even chew it. He just swallows it and, and uh, he's satisfied. And that's the way I find so many Christians are you know they're like dogs man and not to insult anybody because i'm that way myself they just go go okay i'm satisfied you know i believe i'm satisfied uh but when you stop and consider the things that we've considered today it's like enjoying the taste of the steak one small bite at a time and you have a chance to savor it and uh and and actually be satisfied uh more than just filled you know and so uh, I'm so glad to, to contemplate these great things that, that God gave us to contemplate. He didn't leave it there just to fill our belly, but to uh, fill our minds. Yeah, I'm, I, 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 uh, I studied speed reading uh, many years ago, and, but it, it, it takes some practice to develop it as a skill. And I'm, but I, what I found from it was that uh, um, you, you, for at least for me, is I, I, I didn't get the what I really valued most about the reading, and that is, as you said, um, the ability by reading slowly. And I, I am a slow reader, and especially now, as I'm reading this aloud, uh, you probably have noticed it. Uh, my reading is not that good. It's, it's hard to read because my eyesight and everything, and my, I don't know what it is, but I, I'm struggling to read it and get it all right. Um, but when I read, I've always liked to read very slowly. My words per minute when I read is slower than average. And it's because as I'm reading it, I want to think about it. I want to savor it, as you said, with uh, that each bite of the steak, or in my case, that main lobster. You know, well, so, you know, I'm I'm like that too, Luke. I, I uh, now that we're doing this, this, you know, looking closely at what's written, it's a it's a it's a whole different animal, uh, because it, it really does have a lot of intricacy and and a lot of things that that we we should consider that we don't when we, you know, act like most Christians, and okay, the sermon's gone past fifteen minutes. Or if the sermon's gone past 30 minutes and, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, I got it. I believe, okay, yeah, I got the point. You know, let's get home. You know, uh, there's something obscene about that. It's like, it's like going to the Louvre and, you know, uh, trotting through the, through the, uh, the Picassos, you know, without stopping to, to try to contemplate what you're looking at. And so you can know a painting is great or you can know a steak is, is good but only when you stop and, and uh, take your time with it. I think the word says to meditate on the word. Well, I, this is a good example why. Hmm. Yeah, um, I, I, this is probably a, a good time for me to, to comment on a conversation that we had recently about how long should a video be. And uh, I've got over 600 videos I've produced and and there's hundreds of them that are 5, 10, 20 minutes long. And then there's hundreds of them 
that are um, uh, an hour, two hours, or three hours long. And uh, the thing is, if if this was um, not recorded, and a person could listen to it live, but it was not recorded, they, in order to hang in there with us for hour and a half or two hours, I don't know how long this one is, but um, to, to hang in there for two hours, uh, it takes a special uh, um, person that has a high degree of interest in the subject and for them to sit in there, particularly knowing that if they go away, for, they're missing something and it, it, it's gone. They can't get it back. They've lost it because it's live. Like if you're attending a sermon in a church, you know, you must pay attention all the time or you've missed it. But because this is a recorded video, a person has the ability to play it, stop it, think about it, play it back, you know, watch it for 10 minutes. And if your schedule is, or if your desire is to watch it in small increments, you could watch a two hour video. And I do this quite often. I watch a lot of long videos. I probably watch as many videos on YouTube as anybody. If you like watching YouTube videos, I don't think you watch more than me. And, and I watch we don't want to get down on, on people's human nature though it is human nature to you know sometimes i'll see a video that's five minutes and i'll see one that's 25 minutes and the the titles are of equal interest chances are i'm going to gravitate towards the the five minute one but uh you know it it, it you're right it takes a, a person who has a, a deep interest in things and and you know for for those who would sit in a two and a half or three hour hangout talking about atheism or talking about rebuilding car motors uh that seems that seems quite reasonable but for some reason when we talk about the things of scripture uh, all of a sudden it's not as as uh, interesting as car motors or american idol or or whatever it is i mean it, it's no problem at all for someone to take an hour and watch american idol and and oh good it's an hour and a half it's the finale you know and so, you know, God's got a, a spark and interest, and, and hopefully he does in some. But if nobody watches it, I am so enriched uh, studying with you that uh, I don't care. I mean, I do care, but, you know, I, I, I've, I've been filled, so I'm good. <laughs> yeah, um, but um, what I'm trying to point out, I want to make is that um, if I see a video, that let's, first of all, the subject has to interest me. So let's assume that you're interested in the subject. And then I see the video and it's really long. Um, that does not deter me from watching it because I know because it's recorded. I don't have to sit there continuously paying close attention for two hours in one sitting. I can watch it, uh, a two hour video over the period of a week in small doses, you know, when time permits it and, and just pick up where I left off. So that's why, uh, I, I think that uh, I don't know what made me get off on that subject. You well, said something. We discussed, it, we discussed it with a couple of people, and you know, it was even even someone suggested, well, you could do these and then <clears throat> abbreviate them, go in with the uh, film editor and cut out the parts uh, that are uh, more compelling than others. But I think that would be obscene today. I think every single second was uh, was worth watching. I wouldn't want to cut any of it out. All right, thank you. Well, let me conclude today with the, uh, the gospel message. <clears throat> we always want to end every one of these broadcasts uh, with this message. Uh, the word gospel is a Greek word. It means good news. And if someone is telling you the gospel and the video is an hour or two hours long, then that would be a red flag to me because if they're if they're taking that long to explain it, they're probably over complicating it, and what the the Bible refers to as uh, perverting it, uh, because the gospel is a really short, simple concept, and, and it's good the good news that you get to go to heaven if you desire it. You get to go to heaven. Uh, simply because of your faith in Jesus, he will give you your place in eternity in heaven as a free gift. If you want it, Jesus is offering it to you as a free gift. That is the good news. It's really that simple. Um, you're not required to join a religion. You're not required to become a religious person. You're not required to follow some set of religious rules. You are required to do one thing. 
depend on Jesus as your savior. Rely completely on Jesus as the means of your salvation. Believe that you're going to go to heaven for one reason, because Jesus promised it to you. And when you put your, when you have that kind of faith in Jesus, uh, the Bible says you're guaranteed. It's a certainty you're going to go to heaven, and it's irrevocable and irreversible. Um, but let me tell you some facts about Jesus and who He is and what He's done for us. The Bible says He is eternal God Almighty. He came down from heaven. Uh, God manifest in the flesh. God became man, uh, and Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the reason he became a man was to give his life as a ransom. Uh, in other words, he would he would die as a payment to set you free from judgment and condemnation. Uh, and, and that Jesus did that. Uh, he died on a cross, and that death on the cross served as a full payment for all of mankind's sin. Your sins, and I hope you can understand that you're a sinner just like the rest of us. Uh, some people sin more than others. We have our different proclivities and types of sins that we all prefer. But the fact is we've all sinned, and therefore uh, we need the, a payment for that of sins. Well, we could try to pay for it ourselves, but but that's doomed to failure, the Bible says. But but uh, but the successful answer to our, the sin problem is Jesus. He died for our sins. He paid for our sins. And uh, he said, it is finished. He succeeded. He accomplished his task of paying for our sins. So believe that Jesus paid for your sins, and now you're reconciled with God. You have access to God. You get to go to heaven and you can receive eternal life in heaven simply because you trusted Jesus. And this resurrection that we've been talking about, Jesus promised it. He said, uh, I'm going to die. I'll be buried. I'll raise myself to life on the third day bodily and I'll prove my, myself to you by the resurrection. I'll prove I am God. I am the Savior. I am the sole source of life everlasting. And I hope today's study gave you confidence that there was a resurrection and that served as the proof and that should give you confidence that your faith in Jesus is justified. If that's your conclusion, put your faith in Jesus now and we will all be celebrate in heaven together. Uh, brother, any final thoughts before uh, we end? No, no, that, that summed up exactly what I wanted to hear. That's great. Okay, Joe, thank you for uh, participating. And the viewers, thank you for, for watching. Uh, join us next time for chapter six. Bless you all in the name of our great savior God, Jesus Christ.